Okay, excellent. So now we're something completely different. Um, <laughs> totally, uh, totally applied, but uh, I think still very similar, well, similar or more, even more extreme challenges that we have. So um, first, I have to tell you a bit about what I and my colleagues are trying to do. And we, want, we, want to, we, have, some, we have a very uh, 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 broad, fundamental questions we want to answer. So we want to know what is the fundamental structure of uh, the universe, basically. Uh, in order to do that, we have to build a giant microscope, the biggest microscope that's ever been built. And here is sort of the time, uh, 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 many decades of distance scales uh, from the, the smallest things I can see personally to the smallest things we can probe physically. Um, and you can think of the Large Hadron Collider, which is the experiment I work on, um, as a giant microscope in Geneva, Switzerland. Um, and uh, there we go. Uh, here is uh, uh, basically a data pipeline from collecting the data all the way to analyzing it. And we have a, a big data problem from uh, the whole entire pipeline. Um, in the beginning, uh, we collide protons uh, every, at 40 megahertz every 25 nanoseconds. And every time we collide uh, a proton proton collision, we get something like uh, 10 to 100 megabytes of data. And, we, uh, and that, that rate is, is really enormous, but we throw most of that data away in real time. Uh, and so we have what's called a trigger system, which I'll describe in more detail. But as these, the, uh, and at this time scale, we have proton-proton collisions, uh, a bunch of physics happens, um, the particles hit our detector, uh, we have to decide what to record and what to throw away. Um, and then, and this, this all happens very, very quickly. So we have something like, um, uh, uh, so, something like 100, or say a few uh, microseconds to decide in hardware if we're gonna save an event or not. And then we have a second level uh, where we decide to save things or not, which is in software. And we have giant computing farms where we have something like 100 milliseconds to decide. Um, and then uh, we have to do a lot of offline processing. And even the offline processing is now sufficiently slow that we, we are sort of being, it's, it's sort of bottleneck uh, in, in the whole data processing uh, pipeline. So I'm gonna uh, describe uh, a few of these steps and what the bottlenecks are and how we're trying to solve some of those challenges. Uh, okay, yeah, and I just say uh, on the very top, the number to keep in mind. So we're generating something like terabytes per second. We throw most of that away in real time, and some of that is in hardware, some of that is in software. Okay, um, so first I'll tell you about uh, the detector response. So uh, here's a picture of what uh, the detector that I work on looks like. So the protons come basically through the center of the detector, and it has many, many layers. I like to say it looks like an onion, but I, my wife tells me I should instead say it more looks more like a leak, because it's more like a, a long cylinder with many, many layers. Um, and uh, this is uh, a big data volume uh, problem, uh, and the biggest uh, challenge for us is at the innermost layer, because you can think about as the particles go out, um, basically the density of particles decreases as you move further away. So the innermost part of our detector, which is this little part in here, has the largest uh, data rate and significant data problem. Uh, there we go. Okay, so uh, here's a, a sort of like if I remove the detector, I might see what the particle collisions look like. So there's a lot of particle, go, a lot of particles shooting out from the inner part of the detector, and here are just some numbers to give you a sense of uh, what the data rates are like in terms of the occupancy of our detector, uh, the flow of data, and these are numbers you're probably not used to seeing, which are the radiation, irradiation of our detector. Um, and I'll just very briefly flash some, some numbers here that are really irrelevant when you look at the numbers, but I wanna just say that this is like having a, a digital camera on your phone on steroids um, that also has to be next to a, a nuclear reactor. So that makes it uh, very difficult, and unfortunately, um, there's no commercial uh, hardware that can be able to withstand these, these conditions. So uh, we make our own. Uh, and the innermost parts of our detector have these custom electronics that, are, that have to do real-time decision-making and decide what to store and what to throw away. Um, not only which events to save, but what about those events to save. Um, and so we design custom ASICs that are uh, radiation hard and very fast. And basically the idea is, uh, this is like what a schematic diagram of the innermost part of our detector would look like. You have some charged particle going through, it leaves some charge in our detector, we have a little electric field, it drifts up here and we have this, uh, these electron this, this readout chip, which then does some processing uh, uh, locally. Uh, and then uh, it has to buffer the data, and then the, then the buffer data will then be decided to be saved or removed. Um, and uh, we basically can't uh, spend too much time uh, or have too, many com too, too complicated of an algorithm because of all the requirements that we have. So for instance, when the particle goes through the detector, we can record something about how much energy was left, and we don't have enough time to have some analog readout, so instead we do something very simple, which is just to have a constant threshold and then ask how long uh, was the charge being collected over some threshold. And we have this 
this 40 megahertz clock to every 25 nanoseconds, which is a natural frequency of, of the collisions, and we literally just ask how many, how many of those 25 nanosecond crossings is it over threshold. And this is a number, which is a digitized version of the collected energy, and we use this for many purposes, and we have to spend a lot of time trying to understand exactly how we use that information. There are many, many uses, for instance, to determine the positions, the intricate positions of where the particles were, the charge distribution can be useful for that purpose. Um, as well as identifying the type of particle and the number of particles in a given patch. Of look, uh, given patch. And uh, the point is that uh, we have to decide this basically ahead of time, because once you design the custom electronics to do all the um, processing and buffering, we can't change it later. Um, and so this is something that we're now actively thinking about, because in 10 years, we're going to upgrade our detector, where the rate of collisions will go up by a factor of 10. And so we're, this is like a really uh, big topic right now. Okay, so back to this, uh, this picture. So another key challenge that we have um, is about this, uh, this trigger. Um, that I mentioned before, um, where we have to decide in real time, uh, either in hardware uh, uh, in a, you know, a few microseconds or in software a few hundred milliseconds, uh, if we're going to keep the event or not. Um, and uh, this is a particularly big challenge because, <coughs> so this is a, a, a diagram that shows the rate at which things happen, um, and these are various processes. So the rate of something happening has some particular rate up there, which I've circled, but we actually don't really care about that. We care about all the stuff down here, which leads to Nobel Prizes. And the rate gap between the stuff we don't care about and the stuff we do care about, like the Higgs boson, which is here, which won the Nobel Prize like a few years ago, um, is very huge. So basically we have to, we can't record everything, we just don't have enough physical space to record or the speed to do it. Um, so we have to throw away almost everything. Um, and as a result, uh, we have to be careful about what kind of uh, signatures we're able to record in real time. So this, this plot shows, it's kind of a busy plot, but it shows, uh, uh, a dec basically decomposes the, the kinds of uh, things we're, we're saving. Um, they're very diff there's different categories here, so there's like, we might save uh, electrons of a certain energy. Um, but then there are a lot of other things that are more prevalent that we just can't possibly write uh, to, t to tape fast enough, so we, we call prescaling. Basically, we throw away randomly some fraction of the data, even if, even if it's potentially interesting. Um, and so this is obviously not great, um, and there's a lot of there's significant efforts now, basically, to try to redesign how we're doing this, because it could be, we haven't found anything new beyond the Higgs boson, and it might be that we haven't found it because it doesn't exist, or because we're just not looking in the right place. So we have to basically um, uh, make sure that we're casting a wide net, um, and there are a lot of ideas for doing this, um, uh, in particular, having smarter triggers that can do more things online, um, and, and take advantage of more bits of the detector in real time. Uh, and this allows us to do things like in this plot, this is like a, an energy spectrum uh, that's being probed by uh, some particular search for some new signature. And uh, there's a little funny feature here is because uh, at low energy, there's just, the rate is so high that we have to throw away most of our data. Um, but then these, uh, these clever schemes for online throwing away, not events, but part of the event, so having compressed uh, amount of information allows us to basically extend this to lower energy. Okay, um, <laughs> now uh, it's even more complicated because uh, we don't just collide two protons at a time, we actually collide many hundreds of protons at a time uh, uh, and in, the, in the sense that we get many collisions. So this is like one bunch crossing at the LHC every 25 nanoseconds, we don't just get like one beautiful proton collision, we actually get like 100 proton collisions at the same time. And we only care about one of them. Um, and that can be very challenging, so you can see we can sort of reconstruct all these individual vertices of collisions. Um, but it, it actually might be that we can use this to our advantage even um, by uh, triggering on one of them, say the pink one, and then also looking at all the other ones. Right now, we spend a lot of time using, these are basically a nuisance to us, but we could also use them uh, for interesting uh, physics analysis. Okay, so back to the, the schematic. So uh, I've told you about some of the lower level hardware stuff, so now I wanna tell you a little bit more uh, about uh, a little bit later in the processing. Um, and uh, this is related to those extra collisions that I told you about. So these extra collisions are a source of noise, and these are basically a nuisance to us. So it's like, imagine uh, I'm, I have an image, of my, I think of my detector as an image, a very complicated image, because our detector, by the way, has 100 million readout channels. Um, so yeah, it's a very uh, granular, a very uh, pixelated image, detailed pixelated image. Um, we're now throwing on top of it some noise. Um, and this really just calls out for some kind of machine learning image processing. But uh, we have a couple of interesting challenges. Um, one, our images are totally sparse. So they don't have a lot of structure. They're not like cats and dogs. Um, and also, we know something about our images. So uh, because we, there are two kinds of particles, charged particles and neutral particles, and it turns out we can actually tell if the charged particles are noise or not. So I can think of my, my detector image as having uh, uh, some image from the charged particles that I care about, the charged particles that I don't care about, 
and the neutral particles that I can't tell if they're interesting or not. And I want to take these three images and predict another image, which is the image that I care about, the neutral from the, from the, the collision I care about. So this is just calling out for using, say, convolutional neural networks. Um, and uh, uh, basically, that, that seems to work pretty well in simulation. Um, so this is like, a, as a function of the number of extra collisions we have in our event, um, this is the correlation between the reconstructed and true value in simulation from a particular quantity that we care about. And basically, it would be, if it was flat at one, that would be great. Um, and it degrades a little bit, because the more noise you have, the worse it is. Um, but these, these uh, uh, machine learning based approaches compared to the traditional approaches um, do very well. And so that's uh, particularly exciting. And I think uh, I'm going to say a little bit more as the talk goes on about places where modern machine learning is making an impact on our uh, full uh, data processing uh, workflow. OK, so the last topic, which I'm going to spend a little bit more time talking about, um, now moves back up, actually, which is about the uh, interaction of particles with our detector. And uh, a really uh, complicated thing that we have to do, uh, uh, and amazing thing that we can do uh, at the LHC, is that we, in order to do inference, uh, scientific inference, we have to um, simulate a lot of data. Basically, the, the usual pipeline is um, we measure some data in our detector, we have some simulation, and we compare the two, and we ask if it looks the same. <laughs> And uh, we can simulate very, very well. So uh, here is a sort of schematic picture of an event at the LHC spanning 20 orders of magnitude, obviously not to scale. So the, the sub-nuclear physics is down here. Then you kind of get subatomic physics. Then you hit the detector. These are supposed to be deposits of energy in our, in our calorimeter, spanning something like 10 to the minus 20 meters at these sub-nuclear distance scales, all the way up to the meter distance scales in our detector. And simulating this whole thing takes like a minute for every event. And that's very slow, because we need to simulate like many billions of events. Um, and the reason that it's even able to work at all, I mean, you might ask, why can I simulate 20 orders of magnitude, is because there's sort of like a Markov property going on here, which is that the physics at some distance scale only depends on one distance scale below. So if I know everything at some distance scale, uh, I only know the one below it in order to do the next level. And so that allows me to go higher and higher. And there are many stages. So at the smallest distance scale, we have all the, we encode all of the high energy physics of what's going on. So it's supposed to zoom in on the subnuclear bits. And there are relatively fast um, code, data, code bases for doing this. And if you're curious, I can say some things about how people have been thinking about using HPCs for this kind of thing. Um, but this is basically not the limiting factor in terms of speed. Then when the next step is basically the formation of uh, atoms, so the, the, the start of the atomic physics, and uh, the evolution of these, uh, the fundamental uh, uh, constituents that, that evolve all the way up into uh, sort of the atomic uh, physics, um, this is also not, not that slow. Um, and there uh, makes heavy use of Markov chain Monte Carlo that's basically extremely efficient, and this is not the problem either. Um, what is the problem is the interaction of particles with our detector. So this is supposed to represent our detector here and the particles that they hit it. And we have to model the detailed uh, nuclear and electromagnetic magnetic physics of particles propagating through big chunks of material. Um, basically, the way you detect a particle, you put something in front of it and try to stop it. A and this accounts for basically all of all the computing resources that, that we have. And we have a lot of computing resources. Um, so this is a, a significant challenge for us. Um, and so uh, uh, I think there's been an interesting push recently to try to replace or augment some aspects of this with modern machine learning, which I'm going to tell you a little bit about. Um, because this is, is related, actually, in part to, uh, uh, to databasing and also in general simulation, because uh, we want to be able to attach to all the particles that are detector some realistic uh, uh, interaction shower pattern um, of, the, of, the, of, the, of hitting the detector. Um, and so one uh, reason that um, we, we should care about this is because uh, a lot of physics analyses are forced to use this, this kind of very slow, detailed, very impressive, uh, but still very slow simulator. Um, and that's just not going to be good enough for all analyses at the LHC. So, so you saw this picture before. And uh, just to give you a sense, so uh, now in real numbers, this is where 3 billion events would be um, in the upgraded detector that's going to happen in 10 years. So everything below this, um, uh, we basically would need more than, uh, 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 there'll, be, there'll be less than, than, than 3 billion events. Everything up here is more than 3 billion events. Everything below here is, is, is less. Um, and so if you want to be able to simulate the background processes to, your, to your, your, the thing you're looking for, um, you're going to need uh, a significant number of events uh, at the LHC. At the, at the uh, upgraded uh, uh, LHC. Um, so yeah, if we don't do something, um, basically we won't be able to analyze our data. That's a problem. And if we do something now, we can maybe even save some money, which would be great. 
Okay, um, so the question, one question you might ask is how can machine learning help? So training neural networks is uh, incredibly slow. I think many people here are here probably familiar with that. Um, but the evaluation time is incredibly fast. Whereas physics-based simulations are very slow, so it can take minutes, to, for minutes per event to simulate you know, one event, um, which is uh, incredibly slow. Um, but the question is can we match the slowness uh, of uh, um, a uh, physics-based simulator with the high fidelity speed that we might get in a neural network. Um, and so here's like a schematic picture of what you might expect. Here's like a particle hitting a detector, um, say a three-layer detector, um, and it has some, basically, it's, you can think of it as like, a, like an RGB image with different, uh, different uh, 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 energy patterns in each layer. Uh, the only complication, um, uh, which very briefly, the only complication is that uh, the pixel size is not the same in every layer, so that's already a problem. Uh, and uh, there's a sort of causal structure. So the energy pattern here depends on the energy pattern here. It's, it's like a very short movie, actually. Um, and, and the fact that uh, there's a, a causal structure and non-uniform granularity and the, and the images are very sparse makes this uh, uh, quite a complication. Um, but uh, I think uh, we've uh, been playing around with that and a lot of uh, other people in the community have now started thinking about this a lot as well. And so here's a, 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 a table that shows um, some numbers. So uh, this is like evaluating this traditional physics-based simulator on a CPU with some architecture, and it takes you know however long it takes to generate one um, interaction of the particle with this simplified detector. Um, and if I use uh, a neural network-based approach based on uh, generative adversarial networks um, using uh, a GPU and taking advantage of batching, then I can make it sort of five orders of magnitude faster. And, and batching here is relevant because a given event at the LHC might have like a thousand particles. So a thousand here is like not a crazy number to compare with. And uh, this, this gap here, uh, I think is, uh, uh, both numbers will improve over time, um, but I think the, the fact that there is this huge gap is, is uh, suggestive that maybe we can use some of these techniques um, to improve the, the simulation uh, and accelerate uh, the inference in the future. Um, so that brings me uh, towards the end. Uh, so the LHC is really a, a unique scientific tool with extreme challenges on, on data rate, um, and we really need ultra-fast algorithms, uh, both for uh, online data processing, offline data processing, and simulation. Um, there are many uh, exciting opportunities uh, for fully exploiting our data, and I think we must make sure there's no stone left unturned because this may be the biggest, last, the last biggest uh, scientific endeavor of this kind that we will ever have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ben? So does anybody have a, a question for Ben before I, I lob my, my softball? Frank. So GPUs uh, are quite fast, but they're also memory limited. And I believe at the moment, like, currently shipping large GPUs are, have 12 gigabytes on them. So how much memory do you need to process uh, an event, I guess? Um, is that a, a significant constraint on this computation? Yeah, so it depends on at which level. So the, um, go back to my picture of everything. This one. So at the, at the lowest level, this, this sort of hardware trigger, um, we have constraints uh, on speed and data volume, and there we, it's, it's largely FPGAs. Um, and uh, it has to be in order to get the, the speed and data right. And also they're um, physically close to the detector, which is another problem. And, and also we have a problem of, of heating, so that's also why they're very useful. Um, people have thought about using GPUs um, for some processing, um, but I think the data rate will be a significant <coughs> challenge. Oh, yeah, for their, um, uh, I think, oh. for their GPUs are, are absolutely very powerful. Um, so the, the, the data rate here is not enormously huge. So the, the size of our images are like, at least the ones that are used in this simple setting, are something like uh, order 1,000 dimensional. Um, and you, can you might train on, say, something like 100,000 images. So it's not uh, much bigger than, it's not, not, not bigger than, than many other uses of GPUs that are pushing, pushing their, um, their abilities. So you mentioned, did I hear you that you are using FPGAs? Or, mm -hmm. So um, is it because the logic is evolving or you think, I mean, you don't want to go to ASICs or is there a particular reason you prefer FPGAs? Or? Right, so the, the very first uh, level is all done with ASICs because uh, it has to be incredibly fast, it's very close to the detector, we can't ever change it, it has to be radiation hard. But then we move one step away from the detector 
uh, and we wanted to have a little bit of freedom to change things. Um, and uh, there we, want, we use FPGAs in part because of the speed, in part because of the, the um, like the power that the total heat that's produced, because um, they have to be relatively clo physically close to the detector. Um, and then when we move away from that, then it all becomes just a farm of CPUs. Um, neat stuff. Uh, <clears throat> you mentioned um, how 99% of the data is thrown away. And so the 1% that you do save, can you comment a little bit on what's the volume of all of that data? And more importantly, uh, the age of that data. So how long do you save it for, given that you're spelling, spending millions of dollars to collect that data? Yeah, uh, billions of dollars to collect the data. <laughs> yes, so um, we throw away a bit more than 99% of the data in real time. So I think I had the, I had the number. Uh, it's something like uh, petabytes per, maybe like many petabytes per year, um, sort of like the, the, that we actually like write to tape, and it's saved forever. Um, because these data sets are, can be analyzed now for, th these are unique data sets that will never be recorded ever again, and they will be analyzed for the next 50 years. Um, I mean, obviously it will be some exponential drop over time, but the peak an analysis time will be you know, in the next 10 to 15 years, and then they'll be an an being analyzed forever. So, so how do you pick a training set out of that many billion events? So the usual paradigm is that we, because we have these really high fidelity simulations, is that we can we train on simulated data, which are fully labeled, and then we have some ways of checking that they work in some uh, well understood regions of, of the data, and then we apply them in the data. Which is something unique that I think we have that a lot of other uh, scientific disciplines don't have, is such a high fidelity, relatively fast simulator. Yeah. So thanks very much. One, one last question. Why is the Higgs boson so light? So, <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, if I knew, then uh, I, I would be in Stockholm, but, <laughs> yeah. If I knew, I wouldn't go to Stockholm. Um, okay, thank you very much, Ben. Greatly appreciate that.